production. So uh, I will present the paper on a slightly different title, which is called Financial Regulation, Clientele Segmentation, and the Stock Exchange Order Types. Uh, so think about the market micro structure. Uh, usually in market micro structure, we focus on the binary choice between market and limit orders. So market order take liquidity, limit order provides liquidity. And we got a unique proprietary NICE data set. And we show that market and player limit order account for less than 10% of the volume. That means majority of order types are not market or limit or plan market or limit orders. And stock exchanges now have hundreds of order types. And the most interesting part is like 57% of trading volume comes from order types that refuse Reg MS to route them to the national best bid and offer. So before the start of the conference, I have some short chat with like Beyond. It's basically, it's like one of the major difference between US and Europe a market structure is like US has this like Reg MS, basically defer the best execution responsibility to exchanges. So US has this national best bid and offer and Europe probably do not. But I want to tell you, there's not so much difference because majority of US trading volume actually refuse Reg MS to route their orders. I have three research questions. First one is surprisingly, why so many orders refuse MBBO? That's the best price. What's the point of refusing best price? Number two question is like, are these non routable orders in form? And the number three question is a broader picture question is, is what drives the proliferation of order types? So first, let me introduce the two main rules of regulation MS. So basically they are rule 611 and rule 610. So both of them like in charge of routing. So rule 611 is probably very famous. It's, it's called a non-traceable rule. So the basic idea is like, a, suppose you submit a market buy order to New York Stock Exchange. Let's say the best last price now is $5.81. Even if you enter order to NYSE, your order will be routed to NASDAQ. Why? Because based on regulation, not in the market system, NASDAQ have the best ask price of $5. So this is the exchange application. Surprisingly and interestingly, traders can refuse routing in two ways. The first way is like, you can cancel your order. Basically it's like, okay, I don't want best execution. It's like, I, I, I want to cancel my order. Then you need to add something called do not ship tag, DNS orders to that. That's one solution. Basically, I don't want to do anything. The other one is aggressive approach. It's called swiping. So you can use intermarket swap orders or, or ISO orders. You basically tell New York Stock Exchange, it's like, a, I will take care of the best ask at NASDAQ at $5. I will swap that. That means I will take that liquidity. In that case, NICE do not need to worry about best closing other exchanges and can execute the order at $5 and one cent. The other thing is, uh, it's uh, even a little bit surprising for us. It's like we find actually no trade through does not dominate rate routing. Routing, actually, the majority of routing is done by another less famous rule, which is called Rule 610. Rule 610 seems like a small friction. It's like it prevents locked markets. What is a locked market? So consider this scenario. Now, the trader wants to submit a limited buy order at $5. If there's only one exchange, this trader can establish the best bid at $5. So then nicely we have bid price of $5 and ask price of $5 and one cent. But adding another exchange will fundamentally change the picture because nicely will have a bid at $5 and the NASDAQ have an ask price of $5. Based on regulation AMS, these two orders should trade with each other because they lock each other's quotes. So regulation uh, 610 basically try to unlock the market. It routes this order actually to NASDAQ to unlock the market. So basically this order will be routed and executed at the same price or no price improvement. And there are two types of ways you can avoid this kind of routing. The first way is you cancel the order. The second way is you hide the quote because when you hide the quote, you do not lock the displayed market. So how can we identify uh, the order types? We get a unique proprietary data set, which have complex order types. It's called system order database. 
So you can identify like the kinds of order types using two indicators. First one is like they differ in time in force. Some order do not have expiration time. It's just as long as you don't cancel that, it will be there forever. And they're day limit orders. And they're also immediate or cancel orders. And the second column interesting uh, is like, a, it's called a special order instructions. Uh, there are lots of special order instructions, but there are two main purposes. First one is like, I just show you, refuse routing. And the second type is you can hide part or full of your order size. So what we are familiar are something called a market limit order. It's orders without any further instruction. They are such a tiny fraction of the market. So we call them plan market order, plan limit order, and a plan stop orders. So what are other major types? There are tens of order types. I will show you later, but there are eight major types. So they are divided into three groups. So the first group is called IOC orders. So IOC order has limit order price. So in that sense, you can consider it as a limit order, but if it does not execute it, it will just cancel. So this order is a limit order refused to make liquidity. So you can consider it like a marketable, a market order with a limited price. And there are three main variations. So plan IOC is about 3% of market share, but the other two variations actually dominate. The, other, the one type is ISO, basically it's a swap, swap the market to comply with rule 611. And the other variation is called do not shift. I will see. So if there's a violation of rule 611, uh, it cancels to comply with 611. And day limit orders are more likely like regular limit orders. So it will expire at the end of the day. So they are planned day limit order, which is routable. And it has a cousin, which is called do not shift the limit order. So that means if the exchange or regulation AMS decided to route me to another exchange. I just refuse, I cancel my calls. And the third variation is called a reserve orders. Basically they partially or fully hide trading interest. So they plan reserve order, which is routable. And you can add another tag, which is do not shift the reserve orders. So you can consider the construction of order type like building blocks. You keep on adding layers. You can build more and more complex orders. For example, do not shift the reserve orders. What does that mean? First, it try to hide trading interest. That's reserve. Do not shift means like it's a variation. It's a more complex variation of reserve limit order. Okay. So first, I want to ask the question: Why so many orders refuse MBBO? Most important thing is like I see theory for Foucault is here. It's like fees. We discuss a lot about the fees. We find actually it's rollable orders are often executed at worst price at fee adjustment. Basically. They are supposed to route to the best price, but actually they are being routed to worse price. What does that mean? So consider a buyer. If you establish a bid, you make liquidity in NICE. You can collect a rebate of 0.13 cents. And now let's add another market. Things become complex because rule 610 prohibits lock the market. So in this case, if you don't refuse, your order will be routed to NASDAQ at the same price, still $5. But if you adjust for the fee, things becomes more complex. It's like, because routing, you need to pay. Making liquidity, you get paid. So then there's a 0 0.43 cents difference. And so basically it's interesting, rule 16 actually route order to the worst price. It's the same nominal price, but after fee adjustment, it's actually worse price. So is that majority of routing looks like that? Unfortunately, for limit order, the answer is yes. 80% of displayed limit order, if they are routed, they are routed to the same price. There's no price improvement and you need to pay for the service. You've been routed out to a worse price, but you need to pay. So it's 0.43 cents. Will that make a difference? It will. Because do not shift limit orders. We show they do not, they do not allow, they cancel the orders. They do not allow exchange to route the orders. So if they collect a rebate, 
they make a tiny profit of 0.3 basis point. But if they pay the fee, they actually lose 2.2 .2 basis point because such a small like a profit margin, routing and non routing actually make a big difference. And there's an alternative solution to unlock the market. You can hide your orders. So why? <clears throat> because you complete, if you <clears throat> complete hide your orders, you cannot lock the display the market. So then you can compare two types of orders which are similar. For example, if you display zero size, we find actually that brings you some good news. 99.95% of the time, you get a price improvement. That means your executing price will be at least one cent better than your display the price. But once you decide to display the order, then you run the risk of lock the quote of another exchange. In this case, only like 18% of partially displayed orders obtain price improvements. So another solution actually this is very crazy, very, very interesting. It's like, if you try to not lock a market, you should choose a fast exchange. So why? Because hold all other things equal, orders in slow exchange tend to lock orders in the fast exchange. Suppose you, sub, uh, uh, you submit a $5 buy order to a fast exchange and a $5 sale order to a slow exchange at the same time. Because of the exchange latency, the fast exchange will post the $5 quote first. And based on rule 610, the slow exchange need to route the order to take the liquidity from the fast exchange, even if there's a tiny difference, like one millisecond speed difference. So that means the slow exchange actually has two disadvantages. Number one, slow exchange actually pays the take fee to the fast exchange. And you also lose market share. So how can we prove that? We use a unique uh, laboratory to test that because in normal time, it's very hard to distinguish traders latency from exchange latency. But think about it, they're partially displayed orders. So for example, like iceberg orders. So New York Stock Exchange need to automatically refill the displayed part after it is consumed. So the fuel is, should be very fast. It's like several milliseconds, but still it's very slow. During this small time period, another exchange may establish MVBO before the refill. So that means during the refill process, you're supposed to be a limit order, you provide the liquidity. But at this small time interval, another exchange appear a better price, and then you route, you, you take liquidity from another exchange. So that explains, it's like rule 610 actually rewards fast exchanges. I know Bullish has a paper, Albert has paper, basically shows there are some benefits for a slow exchange. And also, exchange. let's say exchange delay all traders by the same amount. In most theoretical model, it does not matter. And there are also additional benefit to be slow. But if you look at the US uh, uh, landscape, exchange compete aggressively on speed of posting orders. Even people claim they try to slow the market, like IEX. The exchange in the book Flash Boys, they say they want to slow down the market, but they never delay liquidity adding orders. Because if you are slowing adding orders, then there's a chance you will lock the market of a fast exchange. So rule 610 provides one explanation on why exchange want to be fast. So the other example is the speed. So we find non routable orders win three types of speed raises because they have lower latency. So what are the speed raises? Uh, so let me use the animation to describe first two types. So it's based on like Albert's paper and also like Eric's paper. It's like, a, okay, sometimes the fundamental value of a security jump. So then these are the quotes and these quotes become stale because of fundamental value change. And they high frequency traders, some high frequency traders become snipers. And they try to snipe buy these orders at steer price. And so they try to snipe and liquidity providers try to cancel. So basically it's a speed race of snipe orders, cancel orders. So there are two types of speed race, snipe orders and cancel orders. And the other type of speed race actually is model uh, by me and my course at CDLE. It's basically it's like, a because price is discrete, to be the first one in the queue always have some advantage. So that means suppose 
the value does not change. After the execution of the order, trader actually raise for the front two positions. And the first one actually get time priority. So this is three type of speed raises. We find non runnable orders with three types of speed raises. So ISO and uh, do not shift IOC orders. They win 94% of raises to sna snipe their calls. And uh, DNS limit orders, they are more likely to escape from sniping. But regular limit orders, they are very likely to be sniped. And there are some awards to escape out of the selection. So we, we quantify that it's 0.25 basis points. And the raise for front queue positions, we find non routable limit orders win 76% of raises for front queue position. And the benefit to be the first on the queue is 0.76 basis points. So we now have they, four minutes left. Okay. So the, uh, then the question is like, uh, are the uh, non routable orders informed? We find that they are informed at a short horizon, but not long horizon. So our method is something we call a return. So basically, it's the difference in execution price and a bid ask midpoint. So there's more standard name, for example, effective spread, realized spread, but we call them returns for consistent terminology. So as you can see this graph, basically it shows non routable orders collect small and quick profits. For example, ISO orders and DIS orders. So all the orders we do at the time of execution, you pay bid ask spread. That means technically return is negative. But for ISO orders and DNS IOC orders, they earn positive return within one second. What does that mean? That means quote becomes uh, stale. And uh, these orders are used to snipe stale quotes. But these non rotable orders do not make a long term return. So let me give you one example. For example, there are two variations of reserve limit orders. So the rotable reserve limit orders are very informative in the long run. 40 basis point of return in, uh, uh, in 30 days, but do not shift the reserve orders, do not have this long-term return, although it has short-term return. And most informative order types are all routable, and they are all related to corporate events. For example, there's a, an order type called buy minus zero plus orders. So these orders basically use, are used to comply with sheer repurchase regulation. And we find it has a 70-day return of uh, a 30-day return of 7%. And there's another type of order types called do not reduce orders. So of like corporate uh, uh, action. And they are routable, but they are very informed in the long uh, in the long run. But some orders are naive order types. They are also routable. So plan market order, plan limit order, plan stop order, they lose money. For example, stop order lose 50 basis point in 30 days. Limit order lose also 50 basis point. And market order, they also lose money. So that means informed trader, they use more sophisticated order types. So finally, what drives the proliferation of order types? So the fees, speed, and financial regulation. So we want to have data for one exchange, but the cross exchange variation and the evolution of order types actually follows the same economic intuition I just showed you. The order type I show you actually have some limitations. For example, DNS limit orders comply with the rule 610 by cancel order. And now exchange invent new order types to avoid unnecessary cancellations. For example, they invent like slide order. Slide order unlocks the quotes by repricing the order. And there are even more advanced version called hide not slide order. So they choose to hide the quote instead of slide the quote. So this order type actually used to be very controversial because SEC fined best exchange group for a record $14 million for not properly disclose this order type. And DIS limit order also have another limitation. They can still take liquidity within NYSE. So you don't need to pay the routing fee, but you still pay the take fee of 0.21%. And later, NYSE introduced a more purified version of order type, which is called added liquidity only in 2016. So this order 
execute with only when it can collect a rebate. And this order now dominates the DNS limit order in market share. So that gives you the intuition like routing and fee structure to drive the proliferation and the evolution of order types. So I want to have one minute. Let me conclude. We have we make two main contributions to the literature. First is like a, we discover a three-tier ecosystem of order types. Non-routable orders earn small profits at intraday level, but they are not profitable over long horizon. But they are the major order type, 57% of total trading volume. All order types earn long-term return, they are routable. So they incur higher transaction costs at a short, short horizon. So basically, there is a trade-off between execution sophistication and the long-term sophistication. But market, plan limit, and stop orders, they all lose money. And the second contribution is like clientele effects, so probably drive the proliferation of order types. There are regulations. For example, BMZP orders help firms to comply with sheer repurchase regulation. And the DNS and ISO orders help to comply with Reg MS. Fees is also important because nominal price is important, but there are three types of fees, make fees, take fees, and routing fees. If you count the fees, Rule 610 may read raw orders, which aim to provide liquidity towards price after adjusting for fees. Finally, we find non-routable orders win three types of speed raises. So thank you for your time. That's my presentation. I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Ma. And the, the discussant is Albert Menkfeld from Freie Universität in uh, Amsterdam. Please go ahead. Could you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, 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 I can stop sharing, yeah. You see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Um, all right, well, thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to, um, to discuss this paper um, in the, this beautiful conference series that you guys put up. Thanks for all the efforts and the time invested. I mean, it, judging by the attendance, it's, it certainly fills a, a need. Um, and this is, you know, one picture that I love to show. Uh, again, um, showing the brilliance of Fisher Black, who in 1971, uh, wrote uh, a piece in the Financial Analyst Journal on, look, we've got human intermediated markets, um, but if we look far into the future, something's going to change. It's going to be an automated exchange where everybody connects in different ways to the exchange. 1971, uh, mind you, I mean, that's basically the year, uh, it's a beautiful year, it's the year that I saw the light. Um, I, I was born, so it's, it's such a long time ago. But um, this is uh, the, I, I, will, I recommend you all to, to read that paper. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of stuff to say about uh, a paper like this. Um, so the, this, uh, so the, the summary uh, of this paper, there's a lot in this paper, all right? Uh, it's very dense, uh, beautiful data set. Uh, and so I, I took some time, a few days to digest it and, and see what I took away from it. And, I think it's a slightly different message than uh, Mao uh, just um, um, I tried to convey. I, I basically um, I find this study of interest because it uses proprietary data uh, on the NYC uh, to conclude that uh, Reg NMS, so regulation, uh, triggered new order types, uh, the DNS, the do not ship orders, um, to circumvent the regulation. So we have new regulations supposedly doing something good for the community, and then we get it's, you know, proliferation of order types to, to circumvent it. Uh, in fact, uh, and that's, you know, this is one of the papers that I recommend you read from back to front rather than from front to back, uh, because the best part is at, at the end uh, where he talks about, uh, you know, all these order types ultimately uh, replace the plain vanilla uh, limit and market orders that we have in so many models. Um, so this is my, uh, my summary of the paper. Um, I have a few things to, uh, to bring up for the discussion. I'm interested to hear all of your views uh, in the five minutes that we have until the next presentation. A couple of points. First, uh, I'm, I'm struggling with many of the interpretations in the paper uh, because it's really a different thing to, to talk about order types and talk about traders. And, and there's certainly no one-to-one -one mapping uh, from order type to trader. Um, so, uh, you know, statements about informed traders, uh, uh, informed orders, 
it's it's a bit tricky to talk about trades. I'd rather have uh, um, a focus on uh, the, the originator of uh, of uh, trade intention uh, than on uh, order types, to be honest. Um, and, you know, one plain vanilla explanation for all of this, which I haven't seen in the paper, uh, neither in the discussion, is I don't want you to ship my order exchange because you told me that uh, I'm, you know, one of your best clients. Uh, you go, you told me that I'm getting a nice volume discount if I do a lot of business with you. Uh, so please don't crowd anything on uh, that I send to you because uh, that makes me, you know, reach that threshold at which my fees are being discounted. Um, uh, less likely. Um, so I think that's 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 certainly. I'm not saying that what is being proposed is wrong. I think it all makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that this this is another you know uh, very uh, easy uh, explanation for why we see what we see. Uh, you know, somewhat small comment, but it uh, it maybe you know uh, I'm getting uh, disconnected from the conference for saying this, but uh, but it, it, it's the paper writes as if everything goes to trading is information. Uh, and, and yeah, maybe that's worth emphasizing in a conference about information, but it's, I think it's wrong to, to such so narrowly look at the trade phenomenon, trading phenomenon. Um, I mean, this is a quote from the paper, plain market limit and stop loss orders or stop orders lose money and, and therefore are therefore most likely to come from the e-traders. Really? Um, what if I just want immediacy and I have a hedging need, a private need? I might lose a bit, yes, information from the informational perspective, but I got my order filled, and I, you know, I'm enjoying my private value that I that I want. I, my, I basically managed to hedge a risk that I foresaw coming, and I willingly accept a bit of a cost. So I think it's 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 too narrow to have you know sole information perspective. Um, but what I found really interesting is what Mao basically showed in one slide, you know. Actually, you know, one way to read the paper is we have regulation that forces exchanges to speed their engines, right? Remember the part that Mao told, told us about? Um, um, if I want to trade, I'm better route to the faster market because then I'm less likely to have to be rerouted and pay the uh, uh, taking fee. Uh, so inherently, we've created regulation that wants our exchanges to you know, spend money on, 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 on ever faster engines. And, and it's unclear to me, I have this paper with Maria Zoikan, where we basically argue, I mean, it's all formally coded into mathematics in the model, but, but the essential argument is if, if we have the exchange at ever higher speeds, it's getting more likely that the HFTs meet each other in, uh, in, in matches. And if they meet each other, uh, that's costly to one end of the, of the trade. Um, and, and that can't be good for the entire market because they'll charge larger spreads to make up for the cost that they lose when they, when they meet each other in, uh, in, in sniping races. Anyway, the details are in the paper, but, but I'm, I'm very concerned about this. And uh, I, I, this is a beautiful message from the paper, well argued. Um, but uh, again, this is what I said at the end. Um, uh, the, the, the section six is a fantastic section, basically showing um, uh, or arguing that uh, regulation is one of the main drivers of you know, a plethora of order types. So, you know, going back to 2013, uh, the chairman of BATS uh, argued that his exchange had 2,000 order types, 2,000 order types. And he thought it was a bit too much, it was too much complexity. And this is nice, I'm gonna sh share it with you. And if you want it, I can show you the slides and there's a link to the actual uh, document. But uh, Mackenzie wrote it, um, he's now the uh, chief economist at the NASDAQ, but he used to work um, at um, Night Trading. And when he wrote this document about demystifying order types, um, he actually, uh, I, I saw that you thanked him uh, oh, in your um, first uh, first page. So he, uh, he, you must have been in touch with him regarding your paper. But this is one of the slides, one of the exhibits from his uh, small discussion paper. In 2005, Reg NMS was introduced, 2005. Here in this graph, you see 2006 all the way to 2014, the introduction of new order types. So, so, so filings um, from um, the exchanges with the SEC of, of order types. And in you, well, one way to read this graph is it was really you know, in the aftermath of the regulation, but there was a lot of this complexity introduced. 
because of the um, um, maybe because of the regulation. Uh, and you know some of the the, you know, the paper highlights some of the order types that are explicitly uh, designed uh, to, to for the trader to comply with the regulation. Um, anyway, so a bit more philosophical to end. Um, at the end of this paper, um, and it's well written, I, I recommend everybody who's interested in this topic to read this, not only Mao's paper, but also uh, Mackenzie's uh, this, this paper that he wrote, Demystifying Order Types. He, he concludes saying, you know, today's markets are undeniably complex. Okay, that was in 2014, it's still, still true today, maybe even more so. But, but so are our cars and, and planes and phones in the pockets. So that doesn't necessarily make them bad. Uh, in fact, it, it gives us a lot of useful features. Uh, and that's an interesting point to make, but to an economist, it's not the, at least to me, it's not the entire story. Um, the, the, the problem with, the, with our exchanges is that complexity um, comes with externalities. Yeah, I, can, I can buy uh, a, a complex phone because I have a specific need, that's fine. That doesn't put any cost on you. But if you know, the marketplace at which we interact gets more and more complicated because it wants to satisfy my needs, it's going to put cost on all of you. Right? Because you have to modify your system, modify your training algorithms, it's gonna it's gonna be um, tricky for you to. See. And as a matter of fact, this was uh, something the SEC recognized when in um, 2013 they uh, investigated uh, uh, bats or in general with the complexity of markets following a whistleblower case, Hein Bodek. Um, uh, three years ago, we had a conference at Oxford University where Chaim was there, and, and um, uh, you know he got going on um, on how bad the market was. That you need, we need not only do we expose need to modify our trading algorithms when there is a new order type introduced. Not only that, we actually have to ex ante make sure that we know when this new order type is is being uh, created, um, and 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 that's going to be costly to, uh, to us as well, right? So um, um, there's a ton of additional costs. So, so I think that it's, there's something to say for let, letting the complexity at, be at the, at the fringes of the market. So with the, uh, with the people that interact with the market, but keep the engine of the market really simple and clear uh, so that we minimize the, the negative externalities of order complexity. Anyway, um, I, much enjoyed this um, this paper and Mao's discussion is always lively as uh, he's, he's known for that. Um, but you know, my takeaway of all of this uh, is uh, is that a slightly different uh, pitch uh, would interest me more, uh, which is the one about you know what are the true costs of order complexity and and and, and maybe regulation overdoes it uh, by uh, uh, micromanaging uh, the way we interact with our markets. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. I'm looking forward to the, to the general discussion. Thank you much, very much, Albert. Um, uh, since there are no uh, questions uh, posted in the chat, I will uh, turn back to you, Mao, and ask you if you want to respond to um, Albert's comments. Yeah. Uh, Albert, thank you very much for a great discussion. I think I probably need to change the title of my paper again and remove the clientele effects. That's a fair comment. So we uh, we don't know traders ID. The Probably we claim a little bit too much about that. We probably just say some order types tend to be like informed, but there are, uh, we can only claim uh, two things. Uh, number one, we can the maximum we can claim is order types because we don't see traders' ID. We probably try to see some traders are naive. That's probably go too much. That's number one. Uh, number two is like, we probably also need to consider alternative like interpretations, like volume discount. And also some people may have more uh, exogenous need to trade. So they lose money. Uh, they don't care, right? But yeah, thank you.